In this tutorial, we're going to cover static greens functions, and we're going to do that by first generating a set of synthetic observations. We will then generate greens functions and then do an, an inversion for the fault slip using those static greens functions and our fake synthetic data. We will do this in the context of the horizontal cross section of a strike slip fault. We have the general geometry is we have a domain that's 100 kilometers by 150 kilometers. We have a contrast in material properties across the fault. We have one material on the left side that's elastic, another material on the right side that's elastic, and we have boundaries on all four sides of the fault. In this example, we will cover steps four, five, and six of the example strike slip 2D example suite. Step four is variable slip with Dirichlet boundary conditions. Step five is static greens functions with Dirichlet boundary conditions. And step is six is an inversion of fault slip of the fault slip in step four using greens functions that we compute in step five. The concepts that we are going to cover in this example are generation of randomly located synthetic GNS stations using NumPy. That's a sample Python script. We will then uh, use that script to in a simulation of earthquakes using pre static prescribed slip on a fault with variable spatially variable slip. We will cover generation of static greens functions. We will perform a simple inversion of synthetic data using NumPy, and then we will plot the inversion results using matplotlib and h5pi. This is the geometry for our finite element mesh. We will generate the mesh using GMesh. There is also a script for generating a mesh using qubit. It is a very simple geometry. We have uh, four corners of a rectangular domain, points one, two, three, and four. Points five and six define a fault that runs through the middle of the domain. It's a through-going fault. And we have curves that define a surface on the left side of the fault and the right side of the fault. Uh, and that covers our domain. And here I'm showing the, uh, the directions of those curves because GMesh uh, includes or, or includes you know, a direction of a curve uh, or in terms of in sometimes called an orientation of a curve. So in creating the final mesh, we'll use GMesh. We're going to connect the points into curves, curves into surfaces. And it's important to remember, as I just mentioned, that each curve in GMesh has a direction or orientation. The direction is from the starting point to the ending point. When connecting curves into surfaces, you must connect the curves in a consistent direction. So we need to progress through a loop, a curve loop in a consistent direction, as the, as well as have the curves going along uh, in that same direction. So we connect generally our curves in a counterclockwise direction, and then we need when we need to reverse the direction of a curve, we use the negative tag. This is the resulting final mesh. Let's now look at our Python script that is generate gmesh.py. This looks like our other Python scripts for generating uh, mesh using GMesh, we first import the GMesh module, that we then import GMesh utilities that allow us to easily create vertex groups, material groups, as well as define a generic application called Generate Mesh. We create our local application that inherits from that Generate Mesh application. We have a comment here that defines so it gives our layout. We're going from minus 50 to 50 in the x direction, minus 75 to plus 75 in the y direction. Here's our little ASCII diagram schematic of what uh, our, where our points are. Just as a reminder, we have uh, defined some constants that are the uh, length of the domain in the x direction and y direction, our discretization size along the fault, and then our gradient in the cell size with distance from the fault, also called our bias. Uh, for our application or in our constructor, we're going to say we're going to rate, we're going to define some defaults. We have a default cell shape of triangles. We could also do a quadrilateral mesh. 
our default file name is mesh underscore try dot mesh. Then we have our get into the heart of our Python script where we're going to first create a define a function to create our geometry. And we're going to define some local variables for the length and the x and y direction, the coordinate of our lower left hand corner, x1, y1. We then create the points p1, 2, 3, and 4 that define the boundary of the domain. We then create points 5 and 6 that define the fault surface. So here are, and then we add, uh, join those points together in line. So we have points on the y negative going from point 1 to 5, 5 to 2, right side 2 to 3, top 3 to 6, and then 6 to 4 left side four to one, and then our fault is from 0.5 to 0.6. We save the tags of those curves in uh, variables that we can access later. That's what the self dot means. They are class data members. We then create curve loops and form surfaces. So our first curve loop goes negative, the fault, y positive, x negative. Those are all in a consistent direction, so we don't need to change the direction. And then we create a surface x negative by creating a plane surface from that curve loop. Second, we create a curve loop for the positive side, y negative, x positive, y positive, and then we need to traverse the fault curve going in the opposite direction from its orientation, so we give it a minus uh, the tag values that tells you mesh to reverse its orientation when creating the curve loop. And from that curve loop, we create a surface X positive. Uh, and just in passing, I will mention there are times where we traverse the same curve in different directions. And so that's uh, one important use of doing that. This is, uh, for example, a case where we have a fault that uh, reaches one boundary of the domain, but does not reach the other boundary, we tend to traverse the curve in one direction and immediately traverse the curve in the opposite direction. That allows GMesh to know that there is a curve that's embedded. Um, and this is the case where we build up from points to curves to surfaces. Uh, finally, in generating the geometry, we synchronize our mesh that copies the points from the geometry engine, which in this case, we're using the built-in geometry engine geo. Uh, we could also use the open cascade geometry engine to do this same type of thing. Next, uh, the next step in the overall process is to divide the function for, define a function for marking the geometry. We have two materials, tag one, tag two, one for the negative side of the fault, one for the positive side of the faults and we're going to create the physical groups for each material. Then our vertex groups, we have the four boundaries as well as the faults. The x positive and negative boundaries are just a single curve. The y negative and y positive boundaries each have two curves or lines, so we specify those. Fault is a single curve. They are dimension one, meaning that they are curves. They are surfaces, they would be dimension two. That's the tag, this is what we'll use uh, this is the tag for the physical group and the name, and that's what we will refer to in our pilot parameter files. We create the physical group. Uh, then the next step is to define a function for generating the mesh. We're going to set the discretization size based on distance from the fault. So we will turn off the setting the mesh size from points or curvature or boundary and uh, create a field distance that is the distance from a curve that is the that is the fault then we want to uh, so that gives us a distance field now we want to use that distance field to compute a size field we do set up a uh, our generate mesh application has a, a mechanism for generating that field based uh, a cell size field that it has a gradient with distance from the uh, given the distance. So we have a minimum discretization size. It's the discretization on the faults as well as a bias that is the uh, gradient. And so those are two parameters. Pass it to this function and then tell it uh, G mesh that that is a field 
some mathematical expression, set the background mesh size to that size and field. And that gives us a very flexible way of setting the discretization size. Um, using a gradient, then if we're doing a quad mesh, we use the algorithm eight, generate the mesh, recombine the triangles, because GMesh first does triangles, recombine them in quadrilaterals. And then uh, if we're just using triangles, generate the mesh in 2D, and then optimize the mesh that does Laplacian smoothing. Um, and then when we run the script, we call the application main function. <laughs> so let's run this script and visualize the results. Bring a terminal window over here. And oops, generate GMesh. We're just going to generate. We're not going to write it because I want to keep the one that's in the binary distribution. Here's our mesh. If we bring up our visualization, here's uh, we can look at it in say tree view at the very top level. Here's our physical groups. We have uh, material one, material two, boundary curves. There's our boundary as well as the fault. And then when we need mark vertices, we need the lower dimension information. So that's just those points, those six points defining the boundary. And if we wanted to, we could look and see what curves and points are on those physical groups. All right, there's our mesh. So as I mentioned, we're gonna we're doing this in the example strike slip 2D. The directory contains a readme, the parameter files, the Python script to generate GMesh. It also includes a Python script for generating a mesh using qubit. It contains a Python script for generating randomly located uh, GNS stations. That's our fake observations. It contains a Python script to invert the synthetic data for false slip. We have our mesh underscore try dot mesh file. There's uh, also a quadrilateral file. There's the spatial databases. There's a directory containing the matplotlib Python script for visualizing the inversion output uh, results. And then we have a uh, there will be an output directory for simulation output that's created automatically when we run the simulations. All right. So uh, a few comments before we get too deep into talking about Green's functions. In Pyleth, we compute deformation due to a unit or one meter slip at fault vertices for use in inversion of fault slip. The slip decreases linearly to zero at surrounding vertices when we give it a basis order of one for the slip field. This is similar but not equivalent to uniform slip over a patch which is a Makata dislocation, a uniform slip over a patch of the basis order equals zero. Um, when we compute Green's functions and want output at places like locations of GNS stations, we use output solution points. And PyWolf will automatically interpolate the solution field to those user specified points. Um, this is better than uh, post-processing doing an interpolation because it will use the uh, appropriate numerical representation of the solution field within Pilot to do that interpolation. For example, if we had, um, say, uh, looking at a basis order of two, which we will have in step four, it'll uh, use the uh, basis order of two or the basis functions with the basis order of two to do that interpolation rather than, for example, basis order of one, which you might use as the default uh, if you're doing it directly from output over, say, the ground surface. So it's important when you want the solution at specified arbitrary points to uh, use output solution points rather than doing that interpolation and post-processing to get the most accurate results. And uh, we want to point out that using Pyleth to compute Greaves functions allows us 
to uh, compute Gaussian functions where we have arbitrary complex, el complex elastic structure and topography. In this case, we have a material contrast across the fault. So an overview for step four, we're gonna compute spatial variable slip with their say boundary conditions. This uh, provides an example of how you specify variable slip along just a portion of the fault. Uh, we will have Dirichlet or fixed boundary conditions on the X uh, boundaries. And we will use these as generating sort of our fake or synthetic data that they will then invert for uh, the fault slip in step six. So the files used in, these, we already, I think it, we, the wrong direction. There we go. Here's our physics. So now we want to translate our physics into our diagram and parameters. So for um, in step four, we have a fault. So we have a displacement field as well as a Lagrange multiplier field. We're going to use a basis order of two to generate a high resolution simulation given a relatively coarse resolution mesh. So with a basis order of two for our displacement and Lagrange multiplier fault, we are going to specify, uh, we need a quadrature order of two to give exact uh, integration of those fields. For our uh, elast solving the static elasticity equation, we have two materials. Here we give the parameters for just the negative side of the fault. We have description, the label value that matches the tag in the GMesh file. We're going to use uniform material properties for the left side of the fault, density, VS, and VP. Specify a basis order of zero uh, in terms of the, uh, re the rheology parameters and auxiliary field. And uh, we give it for the, the default basis order of zero for the Cauchy stress and strain. For the boundary conditions, we have two boundary conditions, one on the negative side, one on the positive side of the X direction. For both of these are Dirichlet time-dependent boundary conditions. We specify the name of the physical group, the tag. We're constraining both X and Y. X is to degree of freedom zero, Y is degree of freedom one on those boundaries. And we're going to have zero displacement, so we just use the zero dB to give it uh, zero values for those displacements. On the faults, we have one fault, so if the interfaces is a single fault array. On that fault, the physical name of the physical group is fault. The tag is 20. We have spatial variable slip uh, with a linear query type. I didn't specify linear variation for the query type, but I did show the spatial database file name, slip underscore variable dot spatial db. And we'll take a look at that in a couple of slides. Here's the slip distribution. It goes from, uh, remember our fault extends all the way through the domain from minus 75 to plus 75 distance along strike. We're putting in slip just from minus 20 to 20. So just a portion of that. Uh, and we have a discretization size. Um, that's uh, about five kilometers, looks like this. And this is the spatial distribution that's uh, parameterized by the, by the fault. Here's our fake GNS stations. These are randomly distributed uh, using a Python script called generate GNS stations. And so let's, let's, we'll take a look at that next. So this Python script, uh, imports two standard libraries. Well, it imports the arg parse standard libraries with NumPy, which is relatively standard, um, but does not generally come with Python. Uh, installed separately. We have our uh, a class that's our application and down here at the bottom, just to give you, we run the, the main function of the application. This main function um, parses the command line, creates the points and writes the points. 
in our constructor, we define local variables. So we give default values for the random seed, the number of stations, 200. We're going to use a Gaussian distribution of, in terms of spacing of GPS stations with distance from the fault. Give it a max distance of 50 in the default file name GNSS underscore stations. When we create the points, we either can do a Gaussian distribution with distance from the fault or a uniform distribution. For the Gaussian distribution, we set the standard deviation equal to one third of the maximum distance. Generate it, use the normal random normal function to generate that Gaussian distribution, uniform distribution along strike from the minus the maximum distance to plus the maximum distance. Uniform just uses the uniform random distribution. Um, stack the, those coordinates together and return that as an array of points. Uh, with them, when we write out the points, we write a header. We give it a header line, and then we loop over all points. And we're going to write out columns that the first column is the station name, which we're using synthetic. So we just give it a station code of ZZ dot, you know, the station number going from zero all the way to, up, uh, uh, sorry, going from one all the way up to 200. Then we give it the X coordinate using floating point format of 8.1. So eight digits, one uh, decimal. Parsing command line arguments, we can change the random seed number of stations, whether we're using a uniform distribution or, or a Gaussian distribution, what the maximum distance is and what the file name is. Um, so pretty straightforward uh, using standard Python tools. So uh, that just, you can adjust that, you can run that script with different numbers of stations, see the effect on the output and the resolution of the simulation error. So our, in step four, our input files are going to be our final mesh generated using Gmesh. We've already generated that. Uh, we'll look at our pilot app file. That's parameter file common to all steps in the simulation. That's read automatically. Step 04 is our pilot parameter for this particular step. We'll have a variable slip distribution as well as our GNS stations.txt file. So let's next look at the GNS stations.txt file since we didn't look at that when we uh, with the script. So here's our header line, and then for each GNS station, GNS station we just have the our fake network code, station name, and then the X and Y coordinates. And so it's very easy to, to take a station file that you may have for real GNS stations and put it in this format where you can identify the station as well as its coordinates, generally put in latitude and longitude. Now let's look at our pilot app file. It follows our normal structure where we first give it metadata information, then our journal information that controls what is written to the uh, screen when we run a pilot simulation. So we have the application, the problem information, solution, mesh reader, materials, boundary conditions, fault, and Petsy options. Our mesh generator, we're using the Gmesh, so our reader is the mesh IO Petsy. Here's the file name. We use the same mesh for all the simulations in this directory. Coordinate system, spatial dimension of two. Uh, all the simulations in this directory ha are using a fault. And so we set the solution to contain both the displacement and Lagrange multiplier fields. We're going to do output over the entire domain as well as the top and bottom boundaries. We just, it, generally, we're not going to use that information. This is just an example of how you can do output over multiple boundaries. When you do output over a boundary, you have to set um, the default as output solution domain. So we need to set that it's just over a boundary, that no means it knows how to extract the boundary and write it out in the output. And to mark the boundary, we have to give it the name of the physical group as well as the tag of the physical group. So we do that for both the top and bottom boundaries. Our materials, we have two materials, on the, one on the negative side of the fault, one on the positive fault. They have different values or, or different material properties. We could do a single material and use a spatial database to do different materials properties from one side of the fault to another. 
In this case, we decided to do two different materials and then use a uniform spatial database that um, so that the within each material the properties are uniform. Uh, you can do it either way. It's it's relatively easy to set it up um, in the op in the opposite way, but you'd need to set that up when you generate the mesh to have a single material rather than two materials. Okay, so for the negative side of the faults, the label value is one. That's the that's the tag of the physical group. We're going to use a uniform spatial database. Density vs and dp are material properties. Density is 2,500 kilograms per meter cube, Vs of 3 kilometers per second, Vp of 5.29 kilometers per second. Uh, in the pile of that file, we're going to give a basis order of zero. That means you assume uniform values within each cell for our material properties, as well as our Cauchy strain and Cauchy stress output. On the positive side of the faults, we change the material properties. We have the same density, but we have a different shear wave speed. Instead of three kilometers per second, we're now using 4.24 kilometers per second. Same P wave speed, again, basis order of zero for our auxiliary subfields as well as our Cauchy stress and strain. Now on to step 04, CFG. So now we have just a few values related to the description for our metadata arguments which pilot version, which features we're using, output file names. So uh, step 04, variable slip, is going to be what all of our output files start with. Problem, we're going to use a basis order of two for our solution and Lagrange solution subfields at the displacement Lagrange multiplier fault. So that means we need to give it also a quadrature order of two to have uh, sufficient resolution of our integration. We're now adding, in addition to our domain top bottom, top and bottom boundaries, we're going to output a GNS stations. Those are arbitrary points within the domain, so we use output solution points, so we'll get a solution interpolated to those points. And when we do the output solution points, we need to give it uh, the reader that is, that's the file name. It's uh, just a text file as we examined that has the station name, X coordinate, Y coordinate. Uh, in this case, we're just using the default Cartesian coordinate system with a spatial dimension of two. This label is the label used in the output. Uh, I should point out that if we wanted to use a georeferenced coordinate system with our GNS stations in latitude longitude, we'd set that coordinate system here. We'd change, we'd use a geographic coordinate system. Uh, the EPSG code is 4326. Um, so we can very easily specify the latitude and longitude for our um, GPS stations. Those they can, when we do the interpolation, they get those coordinates get uh, transferred to the model coordinate system, and then it does the interpolation. Uh, because we're using a basis order of two, we can increase the basis order from the default value of zero that we gave it in the pile of app file to one for our Cauchy stress and strain. Uh, because displacement has a basis order of two, means we, our Cauchy stress and strain will vary linearly, so a basis order of one is appropriate. For our uh, slip distribution, uh, we use a um, variable slip distribution with a simple spatial database linear interpolation. Um, so now let's look at what that spatial distribution of slip looks like. Starting up at the top. The simple spatial database, we have three values in our spatial database, final slip left lateral, final slip opening, initiation time. Our units, we're going to give in centimeters, centimeters in years, 11 locations. We're going to give points along a line, so our data dimension is 1. We're working in 2D, so our space dimension is 2. Cartesian coordinate system, the coordinates will be given in kilometers, so the conversion of meters is to multiply by a factor of a thousand. So here's our x coordinate, y coordinate along the fault. Our domain runs from minus 75 to 75 in the y direction. We just 
go up to 99 just to make it clear hey this is way off the domain um it's zero i'm pinching out the fault the slip outside of minus 20 to 20 to be zero then i'll have a spatial variation of the uh of discretization of five kilometers going from zero then it goes up to 30 centimeters 40 20 60 80 30 10 and then back down to zero at minus 20 and then again um, outside the domain uh, the spatial database we only interpolate when we do linear interpolation so we have to make sure all of our points within the domain along the fault uh, will have it will be encapsulated within our range of values given here fault opening zero or slip time relative to origin time is also zero so Let's run our simulation now that we've gone through all of this input files through step zero four. Okay, we'll slip. Conversion 27 iterations. Let's visualize the output using pilot viz. Output step zero four, but it's a domain H five. Let's warp the grid and let's show the Y component of the displacement field. So this looks like a very coarse mesh, but remember we used a basis order of two, so we have a quadratic variation within each of these cells. See our big asperity here, if we zoom in, you can see the slight offset. If I exaggerate that more, you'll see the offset increase. And then, uh, so we're going from minus 20 to 20. Outside of that region, we have zero displacement, so the displacement is gonna decay. You can't quite tell our color bar is equal so that white is in the middle, but we do have slightly more displacement on the more compliant side where the sur modulus is uh, smaller. And if you looked at the displacement field values, you would see that. All right, so that is it for step four. So now we have synthetic data. Now we need to generate Green's functions so that we can invert that synthetic data. And in step five, we're going to compute a response to slotic slip impulses along the fault. We'll pick a section here from that's a little bit larger than where we had our slip. So we might expect, uh, might look at a surface trace of where there's observations of surface slip, and then we'd for our inversions, we would select a slightly larger region to compute Green's functions in case there's buried slip um, or uh, make sure we can encapsulate and well-define our ends of our slip. Uh, again, we're going to have Dirichlet fixed boundary conditions on the plus and minus X boundaries, and we'll put impulses here along the fault. So translating that into our problem setup, we no longer have a time-dependent problem. We have a Green's function problem that will automatically select the parameters appropriate for our representation of the fault slip and, and the Green's functions in terms of it knows that it's looping over Green's functions rather than looping over time. And it expects there to be a, a fault associated for, with the Green's functions. So there's... A, uh, within the problem, there's a Green's functions object, or sorry, for, with the, the Green's function problems as a label for the fault and the label value um, for the fault. These are the name of the, of the physical group in GMesh as well as the tag. The material properties and general physics are the same um, for all the other simulations in the directory. Our boundary conditions are the same. What is different is how we're, what we're doing on the fault. We're no longer specifying uh, spatially variable slip. We're specifying cohesive impulses. These are not direct delta functions, 
But as I mentioned before, they are these uh, linear variations in slip where we are have a value of one at a point, and then it decreases linearly to zero at all the surrounding points. Uh, and uh, we are going to, in 2D, there are two degrees of freedom for uh, fault slip. The first degree of freedom is opening. We'll, we don't care about fault open in this case. We just want the along strike uh, slip. So that's left lateral slip. So that's degree of freedom one. So we'll just be computing one component of uh, impulse or fault slip impulses along uh, the length of the fault. In 3D, we would generally do two. We'd have uh, the left lateral as well as the reverse components of slip. We use a spatial database to define over which section of the fault we want the fault slip. And so we uh, we have that in slip impulses.spatialdb. And the basis order here for auxiliary field defines uh, how what how many degrees of freedom we have for our, our slip impulse field. Um, so a basis order of one means uh, we'll have linear variations of slip for each impulse. If we give it a basis order of zero, we'd have uh, uniform patches of slip. Basis order of two, we'd have quadratic variations of slip. And um, that would determine how many slip impulses we had. As we increase the base order, we, basis order, we get more and more slip um, impulses uh, for a given mesh. But we might choose to use uh, a different resolution mesh when we change the basis order as we've done for our cases of where we uh, examine the effects of using a basis order one or basis order two or using uniform refinement or um, similar procedures for choosing the discretization of the problem. So our input files for step five, we again have our mesh, we have our pilot app file, we're going to have step five underscore greens functions at their perimeter file. We have our slip impulses spatial DB. And then again, we have our GNSS stations. So we're going to output our uh, the response, the greens functions responses at the GNSS stations. That's what we'll use in our version. So next, we'll look at the step five file as well as the slip impulses file. So let's go back. To our editor, let's uh, look at our step five greens functions. So more input uh, metadata in this case, because our comment or our string has an apostrophe in it, we need to put it within double quotes to make sure that the single quote doesn't get treated as a quote um, ending or terminating the string and confusing the parser. So that's why we everything that has greens uh, functions in it, we have in double quotes. Have our names of our output files. So we're writing to step 05 underscore greens functions. Turn on the journal information for greens functions. We are going to take our coarse mesh and refine it. We're going to use a basis order of one. So we want a refined mesh. We don't want our super coarse resolution mesh that we generated with GMesh. Change our problem type. Uh, to greens functions. Here's our label, label value for the fault associated with our greens functions. Here's our output, adding in the output for solution points. We'll you reuse all the parameters in the pilot app file for our top and bottom boundary, so we don't need to specify those. Uh, when we talked about the parameters, we already covered what these mean. Again, if you use georeference coordinate system, um, for our model, we could use latitude longitude for our GNSS stations, and that would we would need to set our coordinate system up here for those. Uh, fault uh, interfaces, we are going to use the cohesive impulses, degree of freedom one, that's the left lateral slip, uh, output the slip starting in pilot version 4.1.3. We can also output the traction changes everywhere else on the fault. And again, uh, the, the slip impulses controls the region over where we apply slip impulses. Places above 0 0.5 will be given a, um, a slip impulse at this in areas where we specify a slip amplitude less than 0 0.5 will just have, uh, will not have a slip impulse. Uh, and again, a basis order of one is, is uh, what gives us an appropriate 
uh, Green's functions in this case. So slip impulses here, notice when we go back here, we did not say linear interpolation, so we're just going to use nearest. So anywhere from 25.01 all the way out to 99, it's going to use a value of zero, then anywhere within uh, between plus and minus y equals 25, or y equals plus or minus 25, we have a value of one. So we're good. that's the region where we're going to have slip impulses. Um, and outside of that region, we're going to have zero. So we could have ignored, we could have left off these top and bottom values since we're using nearest. Um, and if it was uh, anywhere up to minus 25.01 or 25.01, it would have done zero. Um, so here are six locations. We say dimension, dimension one that these are point values along a, a line, so it'll just pick whatever is nearest along that line. And we're going to use kilometers for our coordinates. And we have uh, we don't have any time here. We just have slip left lateral and slip opening. Where we've only specified the left lateral component. Um, if we gave a slip opening here positive, it would not be used because of, uh, we said back here that we were only using the impulse degree of freedom of one, which corresponds not to this index, but the index in our auxiliary field corresponding to uh, left lateral slip. So make sure you, that's in the pilot's manual, the order of the, of the fields and what the, what the degrees of freedom correspond to. All right, so that's the inputs for our fields, uh, for our step five, for our Green's functions, pilot step two, five Green's functions. It's going to generate a bunch of Green's functions. Notice that the output, now it's saying, you know, which Green's functions it's doing. Linear solve converges. We still have the nonlinear solver turned on just to verify that yes, we've converged in a single iteration, nothing funny going on. We're seeing the nonlinear solver taking multiple linear solve iterations, um, doing multiple linear solves to converge for a linear problem that indicates that our problem setup is wrong. And but that's not the case here. It generates 13 impulses. Each one takes 20 to 21 uh, linear iterations in the solve. We see that time stepping parameters are not used. That's because we don't use time stepping when we're doing a Green's function problem type. But there were default values that are specified. And there, Petsy just says, hey, these were ignored. All right. Let's go back to our slides. We ran step five. We ran the simulation. Now let's look, visualize the output. All right. Pilot. This following output step two five domain. Uh, let's warp the grid point Y. So we see those slip impulses. All right, there's our first impulse. And as it'll show differences in time, but these are just the different slip impulses. There's our second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And you'll notice it's coming back. And these are the order of the impulses were calculated. And they are the order of the degrees of freedom on the fault. And because we refine the mesh, it does the original mesh, so it's going to skip every other one in general, and then it's going to come back and fill in the, the vertices that are added um, when it did uh, the refinement. So that's why it sort of goes through once and then goes through again. So starting at time zero impulses. Okay. And you see the slip impulses, if we zero in, you can see the little dislocation there and the displacement field. So the displacement field decays rapidly as you expect when you just put an impulse.
Need to pull this over. All right. Okay, we'll just move on. Okay, step six. Let's, let's get this in the middle. There we go. All right. So step six, we're going to invoke The fault for the fault slip in step four, that's our synthetic data using the greens functions computed in step five. So we're going to use a simple linear inversion. We have a greens function matrix or unknown fault slip vector D, an a priori estimate of fault slip D a priori that we're going to have is zero, observed displacement. You observe penalty matrix D, penalty parameter theta, matrix G, where a component I have components IJ gives the displacement component I due to a unit slip from component J. So we have our simple Green's functions times our, dis, our slip vector is equal to our observations. We use an augment standard of equations with our penalties. So we have G augmented D equals UA, where GA is G, and then the bottom is theta D, that's our penalty parameter times D, that is our um, penalty matrix. That's how the penalty is distributed over the degrees of freedom. We have our observations and our a priori estimates of split. We use a generalized inverse, so G to the minus G is G transpose augmented G augmented inverse times G transpose augmented. So our estimated slip values are G to the minus G times our augmented displacement, which is up here. All right, run the inversion. Let's first look at our inverting our fault slip script. So our Python script for inverting the slip starting down at the bottom. We run the application called the main function. When we have command line arguments, we don't, we can, we're just going to use the defaults, but we can specify different file names for the, the data, the responses, the observed data, the penalties, and the output. Let's go back up to the top. We use the arg parse, which is a standard Python module. Then we use NumPy and H5Py. They're included with the PyLeth binary distribution. We create an application to find a number of defaults. These are the defaults we're going to use. So we'll take our, uh, we need our output of our slip impulses, how those vary spatially on the fault. We need our uh, fake resp our Green's function response information, as well as our observed data. That's our synthetic observations. And then are going to write our inversion results. We're going to use penalty values of 0 0.01, 0.1, and 1. Um, you could make a finer variation, but those just give an idea of what those spatial, of uh, what the effect of the penalties uh, varying by a factor of 10 re uh, give. Main function, parser command line, increment, uh, command line arguments, get our fault impulses, get our responses, get our observed values. Um, Then we create a penalties that's going to parse those, mix them into a list. We're going to get our, run our slip inversion, get the results, and then write the results. Get in our impulses. Using H5Py, we open the file name, file for reading, grab the values out of the vertices, uh, coordinates of the vertices, the geometry slash vertices. We're going to grab just the Y component. Grab the slip. We also grab just the left lateral component. Uh, the first index is the impulse. The second index is the location of um, along the fault, and then its component. Close that up. We uh, order them by the y coordinate. That makes it easier to plot and easier for our output. Um, so we just 
do the mapping of the reorder and the Y and the slip. Getting our station responses, we open up those files, we get the coordinates, we're going to get uh, just the X, Y coordinates, the Y, the Z coordinate is zero, don't need to worry about that. Um, we also could throw the X coordinate away since they're all of oh, the responses, sorry, the X coordinates aren't zero, but that allows us to write out um, those values and, and sort them, displacement fields. Our observed displacements are in vertex field slash displacement. We get all components. We reorder by sorting on the Y coordinate. Um, not particularly important, but we do have, does ensure that we have consistent. We sort both our observations and our um, synthetic data in it, um, or, or responses to the greens function, sorry, then it, it ensures that we're having consistent ordering. We do need to make sure that our displacements from our responses are ordered the same as our observations. Um, so that's what sorting uh, does here. So we get our ob fake observations, then we, in terms of inverting, we sort of set up the inversion, we create our um, vector of our observations, and we assume zero for our op, uh, priori slip estimates. We run, the number of versions we run is the number of penalty parameters we have, so we loop over our penalties to set up the inversion for that penalty, um, compute our generalized inverse, compute our uh, impulse amplitude, then convert that impulse amplitude by multiplying by our impulse slip. That's the slip distribution for that impulse um, and stick the results in our results array. And then we also compute the predicted results in the residual. So uh, take the estimated slip values, multiply by our A matrix times our impulse amplitude that gives our predictions. And then we can compute the residuals from that and do a, a norm that gives us then our residual norm. And in writing the results, we just uh, give it a, set up what a header line is, write the results, save it um, using the NumPy save text that gives column output. And we chose uh, the format of the columns to be uh, scientific notation uh, with 14.6 uh, of the fields. All right, so that's what the inversion slip looks like. Let's run it. And so it ran it, penalty parameter 0 0.01. We had a residual norm of 0 0.027. Increase the penalty parameter up to 0.1. We get us just a very slightly larger residual, 0 0.034. Increase by another factor of 10, and we get 0.59. So that's probably a much worse uh, estimate of the slip distribution. So somewhere between like 0 0.01 and 0 0.1 is probably what we want. If we look at our output. 6. So let's look at that output file. So we have columns of location along the fault. So our domain, our fault goes all the way from minus 75 to 75. So we're going to get output at all of our fault locations. And then we have the slip estimate for a penalty of 0 0.01, 0 0.1, and, and 1. And you'll see here, you know, value. So we remember when we prescribed our slip, we went from minus 20 to 20. And so here we're getting values just slightly outside that range. But uh, at minus 23, we're getting, you know, 0 .00, uh, 0.005 times 10 to the minus fourth meters. Uh, then we get it to, you know, 0 0.01. And then we're getting into uh, sort of 10 to the centimeter range here and then back down. Um, so it looks pretty good. We had lot 200 GPS stations. Clearly uh, most seismic inversions would not have 
uh, that many observations for that uh, for th uh, this simple distribution of fault along strike um, over 20 kilometers. We can plot the results. That's in the viz, plot inversion results. And we can compare against our values. So observations are shown in black. Are, um, that's the observed values of fault slipped along the fault. And um, that we had from step forward, then our dashed lines, yellow, purple, and red. So uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, so just a slight increase in the fit with the 0 0.1. And obviously, as it increased the, the penalty up to 1, we are getting a significantly worse uh, estimate of the slip. And here you can see minus 20 to 20 is where the slip was confined. As you increase the penalty, it gives lower values in the middle, so it wants to spread it out over a broader area. So that completes this tutorial on static greens functions.